Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Rafał Olszowski, and it is my pleasure to welcome the honorable guests and the internet audience and to open today's discussion concerning the British and Polish political traditions. Uh, we'll have the pleasure to debate these issues with uh, Professor Richard Butterwick Pawlikowski, uh, Professor of Polish Lithuanian History at UCL School of Slavonic and is European Studies. Uh, professor Alex Szczerbiak, who is Professor of Politics and Director of Doctoral Studies for Law, Politics and Sociolo Sociology of University of Sussex. Uh, professor Bogdan Szlachta, uh, who is Professor of Humanities, Lawyer and Philosopher and Head of Chair of Political Philosophy at Jagiellonian University. And uh, last but not least, Professor Artur Wołek, uh, who is Vice Rector for Organization External Affairs in Jesuit University Ignatianum in Kraków. Uh, this debate is organized thanks to the support uh, of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Poland uh, as a part of the Britons on Poland project. I also invite you to visit the website britonsonpoland.com where the recordings from our meeting will be uh, published and other extremely interesting material also is present there. Uh, so let me begin. Uh, the topic we are going to discuss today is extremely interesting uh, and very broad, but uh, at the same time quite difficult to cover in such a short time. Uh, we'll try to look both at the political history uh, of Poland and Great Britain and the presence of uh, polish britain relations. And uh, we're trying to find out uh, the common ideas, inspirations and intellectual traces. Uh, we'll, find, we'll try to find what connects and uh, what differs these two nations in particular. Uh, so in the first part of our meeting, I would like to ask uh, each of the guests uh, for a few minutes comment uh, on uh, several aspects of, of Polish-British relations uh, from the past centuries until the end of 20th century. And in the second part, I think we'll focus more on contemporary challenges uh, which are open now. Um, all right, so let me begin by recalling the words of Edmund Burke, the 18th century British statesman, uh, who, writing about partitions of Poland, described them as the per first very great breach in the modern political system of Europe. Uh, and he said it was laying the axe to the root of the constitution of our great Western Republic. So despite the distance between the two countries and relatively little knowledge of each other, uh, Burke saw both Poland and Great Britain as a part of European civilization as a whole. So the great Western Republic, he, he said, the, the, the existence of this Western Republic meant uh, Europe as a whole. And uh, therefore, I would like to ask first, Professor Richard Butterwick Pawlikowski, if we think about this period of uh, British-Polish relations in the times of uh, ancient Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and uh, Britain, after the Glorious Revolution, uh, do you agree that we see in both countries the praise for liberty, parliamentarism, republicanism, uh, and do we see any mutual impacts uh, for, uh, in, this, uh, in, this, in these countries? Uh, do you think that, for example, the attempts for Anglo-Scottish Union were uh, associated with, with Polish-Lithuanian Union? And uh, on the other hand, uh, do we see the uh, impact of, of British parliamentarism uh, among the reformers of the, uh, who were working on the Third May Constitution? Thank you very much for the invitation to take part of this uh, fascinating debate. Uh, the 
similarities between the Anglo-Scottish Union and the Polish-Lithuanian Union uh, go back well beyond the 18th century. Uh, and underlying the two political communities is an attachment to the idea of the Commonwealth, the res publica, uh, and participating citizens, an element of self-government, an element of suspicion towards the, the power of the monarch, and an attachment to liberty. In fact, by the early 18th century, you could say that both political communities were so convinced of their own God-given exceptional liberty that they were quite incapable of recognizing it in the other, since for the Protestant British, the Poles were Catholic idolaters, and for the Catholic Poles, the British were Protestant heretics, which obviously meant that the other lot couldn't have been blessed by God. But having said that, once we get into the 18th century, uh, there is an obvious difference in terms of success. The British manage a combination of liberty, property, order, and sort of global expansion, whereas the Poles lose their de facto sovereignty, and in the end they lose their uh, de jure sovereignty as well. And their liberty, albeit are founded on similar principles to the British, uh, becomes a kind of sort of laughing stock. It's dismissed as anarchy. Now that may well be sort of an unfair uh, and unjust uh, opinion, uh, but uh, it's nevertheless a powerful one which helps to define the image of Poland abroad, including in Britain. Now all of that comes to a very dramatic change with the four years parliament of 1788 to 1792 and especially the constitution of the 3rd of May uh, 1791 which revolutionizes the image of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth uh, not only in Britain but in many other uh, parts of the Euro-Atlantic world uh, as well. And we do see a certain convergence uh, in forms of government. Uh, this is expressed, for example, in the shift from the idea that you have the democracy of the nobles of the localities in the diatines or samix. Uh, instead of that, members of uh, these same become representatives of the entire nation. And this is a clear reference to the, uh, the principles underpinning uh, the, the British Parliament. And there are plenty of people at the time who will point out uh, this uh, convergence. So you could say that by 1791, 1792, uh, the Commonwealth is sort of on track to join that group of political communities or states who, for which in the 19th century, the main problem is going to be, where do you draw the line for the franchise? What is to be the relationship between active citizenship, property and uh, education? That, that's not an original uh, comment from me. That was made by the great Emmanuel uh, Rosborowski uh, back in the 1980s. And the second and third partitions and the Kosciuszko insurrection, that changes everything. Uh, by the beginning of the 19th century, we're into completely different political communities when the recovery of independent statehood uh, and the survival of the nation in terms of statelessness become the principal challenges of the 19th and indeed much of the 20th century as well. So a great deal of convergence uh, in the 18th century, some similar ideas despite some contrasts in image before 1791 and then a massive break in continuity with the end of the Commonwealth. Yeah, thank you. So uh, it's a great introduction, I think, for, for our today's discussion. Um, I just think, are these positive and negative stereotypes that origin in so ancient times, are they still pre present today? So do they have still impact? I mean, the, the image of, of Poland, uh, which appeared in 
uh, 18th century England as, as a state of anarchy and even serfdom. Uh, but also a uh, memory of, of uh, King Sobieski in Vienna. It was um, common knowledge about, about uh, uh, Polish king fighting with, with uh, Ottoman Empire. And um, empty stereotypes uh, connected with, with liberty and republican duties, which were uh, saved by the Third May Constitution. And uh, on the other hand, uh, in the eyes of ancient Poles, so in England as the country attached to freedom and uh, place where the individual liberty is so valued, but also a um, uh, country where, the, uh, for example, the Irish Catholics are so oppressed. So I would like to ask the other, uh, other discrepancies, other uh, other uh, other professors, uh, which uh, do you think uh, uh, are, the, are these stereotypes still present present today? And do they have still impact? Uh, how do you think about it? Please, uh, maybe Professor uh, Professor Schlag. Uh, excuse me, Professor, you have to turn on the microphone. Once again, thank you very much for the invitation for this very interesting uh, discussion. From my point of view, uh, the history of, uh, of um, uh, Republic of Poland or Pol Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and the uh, uh, English uh, Kingdom uh, are quite uh, another. First of all, we have, uh, as a Poles, very strong uh, republican uh, and anti-absolutist uh, uh, tradition. Uh, in the 16th, first of all, uh, and the 17th uh, centuries, uh, English political philosophers, English political thinkers uh, discussed about uh, Poland or Polish-Lithuanian uh, Commonwealth as uh, um, similar to Venice and uh, in the second part of the, the 17th century as uh, similar uh, as uh, uh, the very, very, um, very, very uh, uh, um, difficult and, and very, very uh, uh, bad uh, re Republican uh, principles. We have this point as a crucial uh, from our point of view, because uh, from the perspective of um, uh, English uh, political thinkers during the uh, 17th century, we have no good uh, state. We have a state which is uh, very ill, because first of all, we have only one uh, the social state, Schlachta or, or nobility as a uh, as a uh, state of uh, of uh, citizens, uh, and we have not uh, um, the republican uh, state, but first of all oligarchical, not uh, aristocratic, aristocratical, but uh, oligarchical uh, state. And here was very important problem from the point of view of. Um, of uh, the author who, who uh, uh, saw or uh, or uh, on the the two uh, two uh, states, uh, England and uh, Poland, because uh, in Polish um, Polish uh, situation, uh, we have not very strong um, position of king and not not very strong position of the of the um, another uh, another uh, parts of our uh, republic first of all problem from the perspective of english political thinker was in this that we are uh, we are uh, we 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 are, um, are oligarchical uh, or, or oligarchy as a uh, political system second problem from my point of point of view was in this uh, about what uh, said Professor Baterwick-Pablikowski. 
we have in Poland, we, uh, we had in Poland in the 16th, 17th and 18th uh, centuries, first of all, Catholic majority. And this Catholic uh, problem is from the point of view of uh, British uh, uh, political thinkers, very, very uh, important because we have not the um, to to tolerance uh, in our state. Uh, the problem with this uh, we uh, saw uh, in this conversion of our uh, king um, uh, August II, uh, who was uh, Protestant and next uh, was the, the, the Catholic. So these two problems, and we have third uh, because the position of the um, great of great Great Britain. Uh, was on the uh, periphery of uh, Europe and uh, Poland or Polish uh, Lithuanian uh, Commonwealth uh, was uh, positioned in the central Europe between uh, or among uh, um, very strong uh, monarchies. Uh, we have not very strong uh, re republic and we have uh, night bars who was uh, who uh, uh, who uh, were very strong uh, monarchies. And this problem is also very, very important from our um, situations, uh, Poland and England. There's three problems, as I think, we have uh, the crucial, uh, as a crucial. First is the uh, not very strong uh, Republic, Polish Republic or Polish Lithuanian Republic. Second, uh, Catholic religion and not uh, tolerance. And third, this position or, or situation of, of Poland or Polish Lithuanian uh, Commonwealth in the Central Europe between this concert of uh, monarchies, very strong monarchies. And here, this third uh, point was very important for uh, the perspective of, uh, the, of Edmund Burke, because for Burke, this uh, position of Poland between very strong and very non-moral uh, monarchies, uh, Prussia, uh, Russia and, and Austria, uh, was the very important uh, moment in this uh, period of the history, because uh, these three, three monarchies was very similar to, uh, to French, uh, Fran French uh, revolutionists. And the, the same position was, uh, for example, the Tsar of the, uh, Russia, uh, or, uh, or king of the uh, Prussia because uh, uh, they were uh, very unmoral, as said, uh, as said uh, Edmund Berg. This position uh, of Poland in this in this part of Europe was the crucial moment for our uh, history and for uh, the politics of uh, our uh, elites in the uh, last part last. Um, part of the uh, 18th century. Thank you. Can I say something? Yeah. Of course. Yeah. So, so I think your question was about stereotypes, wasn't it? And it was about to what extent are the, the kind of stereotypes that, that, that Professor um, Butterwick Pavlikovsky described still evident. Um, and uh, I think, I mean, sadly, um, knowledge of, of Polish or indeed East European history is, is, you know, pretty minimal, really. It's almost non-existent in um, certainly at, at the sort of the popular level. Um, I mean, I, when I tell my students, and these are people who choose to study East European politics, that, you know, at one time, Poland and Lithuania formed the largest um, country in, 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 in Europe. They're, they're just shocked, you know, they absolutely had no idea. And this is a complete surprise to them. So I don't think I, I don't think that the popular stereotypes are, are, have little or, or, or no relationship to, to what was happening in Poland in the 18th or 19th century. They're more likely to be formed by people's impressions of their plumbers, their builders, um, their um, uh, the person who served them coffee at Costa Coffee, or you know, who cleaned their house. But for a long time, um, coming on to a more serious point, for a long time those stereotypes, however, certainly for, for kind of my generation, were formed by um, but by, by, by a legacy of the Second World War, really, and, and, and Poland as, as, as an ally of the United Kingdom in, in the Second World War. And although it was, you know, the relationship was problematic because particularly at the point when the Soviet Union 
during the Second World War. And, and then, you know, it became a sort of a point of, of a bit of embarrassment, really, to the extent that Poles weren't allowed to take part in the, in the victory parade um, on VE Day, a victory in Europe Day. For most ordinary British people, that would have been uh, that they, they would know somebody who was in Britain because of the war, basically, and that would have been their, um, their, uh, that's on, that's the basis on which they would have formed the stereotype. And here's where I think the relationship is, because here I think the idea of, of Poles as, as freedom fighters, okay, as people who were there because they were fighting for their freedom, but also for ours, to use the, the famous slogan, um, is something that, you know, is a stereotype that I, I, I think was quite ingrained, um, it's certainly in, in, in kind of my generation when we were growing up in Britain. And it was reinforced quite powerfully for a period by uh, the emergence of solidarity at the beginning of the 1980s, where again, you know, people, people at that time, apart from people who were interested in football, would have heard of, you know, two Poles, John Paul II and Beckford Wenzel. And so again, you know, the, 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 the plucky freedom fighting nation, which, you know, stood up to, to to communism, to, to, to you know the Soviet terror, would have sort of played into that stereotype. So I think for a period in Britain, the idea of the pole as the freedom fighter, you know, the kind of awkward customer who won't be pushed around, and you know the underdog who fights back um, with great bravery and, and often against you know absolutely hopeless odds, um, was um, quite evident um, and, and it, among among many polls, I think. Um, I th I, to be honest with you, I think that's now passed. And I think, you know, stereotypes of polls, which as I say, very often formed with, with people as, as encounters are formed primarily on the basis of the post EU enlargement diaspora in Poland. But certainly for a time, that image of the pole as the freedom fighter rooted in the, the World War II um, diaspora and, and reinforced for a brief period by solidarity was, uh, was quite powerful, I think, in Britain. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for this great comment and uh, more contemporary point of view, actually. It's, it's um, always history that it's making impact on, on the presence. So I think it's, we should follow this uh, track. And I would like to ask also Professor Artur Wolek, do you see uh, impacts of past to the pre on the presence, but maybe, maybe on the other uh, on the other uh, side, on the other point of view. So do you have uh, uh, any ideas about the uh, stereotypes of British, of British uh, empire from the past of, uh, of Great Britain that are present in Poland? And do you think they have impact on our political imagination? And maybe as, as a point of reference for the parliamentary Elementary reform and uh, other possible impacts to be said something about it. Uh, microphone, please. Excuse me, but uh, I think we couldn't hear you. Am I right? I'm really sorry, but there is a problem with communication. Uh, so <laughs> probably we'll continue and, and if, you, if you could fix your, your microphone, it will be great. So I can see Professor uh, Butter that would like to comment. Um, uh, yes, while we uh, resolve the technical difficulty, I wonder if I could pick up on uh, uh, some of the, uh, the things that my sort of predecessors have been uh, saying. In the case of uh, Professor Stjelpiak, uh, I do wonder whether the sort of the Second World War solidarity reinforced image of the pole of the freedom fighter does not have some kind of continuity to the sort of the 19th century image of the pole as a freedom fighter. 
but also whether the sort of Second World War image of the Poles as sort of ultra romantic, somewhat impractical, but utterly determined and sort of dangerous enemies might not also have something to do with a rather contemptuous attitude, particularly among British elites to the Second British Republic, which is then sort of linked to the, the one fact about the more distant past that, uh, that a lot of British people do know, and that is that Poland was partitioned. In other words, it was carved up. And why was it carved up? Because they were incapable of governing themselves. Uh, and if you go a little bit further, because they were so obsessed with their freedom that they were uh, unable to, uh, to attend to their own defense. I do wonder where there's a kind of sort of complex of stereotypes coming together there, which in some way the Second World War, which began with another partition of Poland, this time between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union, you know, could only uh, reinforce. Uh, and with regard to Professor Schlachter, he quite rightly uh, sort of picked up several things I sort of underplayed. And that is that in the 17th century and for much of the 18th, the British political tradition on that continuum between republicanism and monarchy certainly is in a rather more monarchical place than the rather more mon republican place uh, uh, espoused by the uh, Polish uh, Lithuanian uh, Szlachta. Right. Thank you, Professor, for this, uh, for this great comment, for following uh, the um, well, for following the historical track, probably, because uh, I think there is uh, still another, uh, another uh, important factor uh, because if we think about these uh, stereotypes about Polish and British politics, which say about uh, Polish romanticism and British so-called political realism. And I think it's uh, the origin of these uh, uh, ideas it could be placed in probably 19th century, when after the national uprisings, especially the perceptions of, of uh, Poland, England changed completely. So now there, there was a reputation for, uh, uh, for rebels, uh, for uprisers, uh, probably because the immigrants appeared in, in England who uh, had uh, great hopes uh, for uh, help, for gaining the help of Great Britain to regain independence. Uh, so probably this is uh, uh, this is uh, some sort of clash because we have the Polish uh, uprisers who are uh, who follow political romanticism, and uh, we have the British Empire, which is in the, uh, on the highest point of, of its development. Uh, so probably this is the, uh, uh, the British point of view, the, the realism, the interest, the politics of interests uh, come from the. Uh, politics of empire. Uh, so I would like to ask uh, Professor Schlachta for, for comment uh, about these uh, sources of, of this romanticism and uh, realism in our politics, which is probably still up to date, which is still, uh, which still has uh, impact on, on today's uh, politics. So oh, thank you. Uh, we, we, we must we must we must think about this that uh, partition of of the Polish Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth um, and uh, collapse of the Polish Lithuanian uh, Commonwealth uh, was the, the very important uh, very important uh, problem and very important fact because uh, we uh, had till the end of the 18th uh, century very big and very huge and very strong uh, state uh, when we uh, uh, when we uh, see from the perspective of te uh, te ter territory but we have not very strong uh, state in the uh, last part of the 18th century and next uh, in the 19th century, we uh, 
we uh, was not very important uh, player in the central Europe. Uh, partition of the of the Polish nation was very important fact because uh, Poles uh, were in three uh, another uh, another uh, monarchies. From the point of view of of um, uh, uh, British politicians, uh, it is very important because we have um, we have we have no we had no uh, state. We was uh, only uh, a part of the big, big, uh, very big uh, monarchies. Uh, from Polish po point of view, during the great uh, emigration, first of all, we as a Poles uh, was the, uh, the Christ uh, for uh, all universe, uh, for all nations. Uh, uh, messianic first of all uh, ideas uh, was very strong very important uh, from our polish point of view very important ideas to create the existence and uh, to to uh, to uh, um, have the situation uh, situation with, which is uh, uh, very um, interesting for us as a poles but from the british point of view um uh, the concert of monarchies in the, uh, the in the con on the on the continent, European continent, was much more uh, important than the uh, situation of this uh, partitioned uh, nation as as Poles. Uh, for example, this uh, um, pers British perspective was uh, very uh, interesting uh, in uh, 1830 when uh, uprising was in Belgium and in Poland or, or, uh, or uh, we, and we have uh, two, uh, another position of the British uh, politicians, uh, uh, very, very sympathetic to, uh, to uh, uh, Belgium uh, uprising and not so sympathetic for, for Polish uh, uprising in uh, 1830. Uh, and here is, very important from my point of view, um, a problem and, and very important uh, situation because during the, the 19th century, you have still the same situation. British politicians saw for the, uh, the situation on, on, the, on the continent as a situation of the uh, equilibrium between, uh, between uh, great monarchies. Uh, the idea of, of uh, uh, sovereignty of people was not very interesting from the uh, per, uh, British uh, perspective and was very interesting from Polish perspective because Poles has no uh, state. Uh, this uh, perspective, this perspective to, saw, to, to see a uh, uh, continental uh, uh, situation as a, uh, as a situation of, of equilibrium between uh, great players uh, was very important also uh, during the, the, the Second uh, World War, as, as I think. Uh, so, normal um, people uh, in Great Britain, as I think, um, reflected about uh, Poles as a, as a um, freedom fighters, but uh, politicians, British politicians, so for this um, problem of, of um, position of, of uh, Poland um, uh, after the, uh, the Second World uh, War, as a um, little player in Central Europe, which, uh, which uh, is uh, um, first of all um, part of the great uh, Soviet uh, camp. Uh, and here is from uh, the Polish perspective a problem because our romanticism, um, which is connected with our Catholicism, which is uh, connected with our uh, position as a, as a, uh, um, a very important um, uh, player on the border between, between uh, uh, Western uh, Christian Christianity and uh, uh, Latin civilization and uh, and uh, East uh, civilization and and um, Orthodox uh, uh, Christianity, uh, from the British perspective, was not very uh, 
uh, important and not, and not uh, the same as a, as a perspective of uh, polls, as I think. So two um, problems, uh, as I think we, we must um, reflect. The first is the position of normal uh, uh, Britons, uh, which saw so, so, uh, Poles as uh, um, fighters, uh, also uh, with, with uh, Germans uh, and with um, the Bolsheviks too, and position of the, the British uh, politicians who saw for um, our uh, situation, saw for, for, for um, the Poles, as a, um, a quite little or not not big um, nation and not the important uh, important uh, player uh, in this part of uh, Europe uh, when uh, partition was not be between uh, three monarchies but uh, between um, the west and uh, east and uh, east um, after the the, the um, uh, the end of the uh, Second World War. All right, thank you for this comment. Um, I would say that when it comes to romanticism, uh, so despite the completely different situation in both countries, I always remember the presence of, of Kościuszko in the literature, uh, for example, in Samuel Taylor Coleridge's poem, uh, which uh, I think it really contributed to the increase in popularity and interest in British pub uh, British public in, uh, in the topics related to uh, Poland and and uh, the situation. Um, yeah, so uh, I can see that um, Professor uh, Wawek is back with us. So maybe we try to uh, uh, try to uh, return to this question about uh, possible impact. On this okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. yes absolutely. Okay. Thank you. So, so, sorry for for this. Maybe uh, you may know that Krakow was today, well, is today the most polluted uh, city in the world, uh, with Calcutta somewhere, you know, uh, not as half as as we are polluted. Uh, so maybe this affects not only our brains but also the internet. Uh, so. I, well, my impression is that we are just exchanging stereotypes all the time, uh, which is maybe not a polite comment on uh, 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 the exchange of uh, professors, uh, but it's really deeply rooted in, in our, our minds. Because I, I just wanted to remind you that uh, uh, England was also a great supplier of romantic ideas. And it wasn't a Polish idea to go somewhere uh, to Greece and die there for uh, the sake of uh, the Greek people. Uh, the, this was a huge inspiration for, for Polish romantics. Uh, and uh, well, the Israeli, if you want uh, something a little bit more, uh, you know, right winging, uh, th this was also a, a, a completely different approach to. Uh, to politics than uh, is uh, stereo stereotypically uh, associated with uh, with the British approach, and uh, we've been talking about, uh, in, in fact, as a as a you know uh, a realist, serious player, uh, uh, superpower vis-a-vis -vis this uh, small nation. Uh, divided uh, with, with their strange ideas uh, of messianism and so on and so forth. Uh, so, so this was just a remark, you know, uh, not really from uh, from my field of research, uh, but uh, as we speak about the stereotypes, I just wanted to to stress this. Uh, but this is exactly what uh, what I wanted to uh, to say about the stereotype of a of a Britain in, in Poland, which is still very very strong, uh, which is a stereotype of a gentleman, uh, 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 you know, distant, uh, rather phlegmatic, we say, uh, and then we we had these hordes of uh, lower class young uh, uh, Britons coming to Krakow for 
the stack parties. Uh, and uh, th th this was a an very interesting uh, uh, confrontation of the stereotype with uh, a part of reality we, we didn't have uh, an occasion to, uh, to confront before. Uh, so, but it didn't change the stereotype because, uh, you know, the, uh, these young gentlemen uh, are coming only to Krakow or Warsaw or maybe Wroclaw and, uh, uh, and the culture is uh, stronger than the uh, impressions of the inhabitants of, of these three cities. Uh, so, uh, and again, we, when we started to follow the Brexit uh, saga, uh, this was very much against our impressions of British politics as something rational, realist. Uh, this was very much Polish-like, uh, you know, uh, uh, a little bit, uh, okay, eccentric leader is something we, we, we could afford, uh, I mean, we could uh, uh, accept as a as a as a British like okay eccentric leader is okay, uh, but all those uh, uh, you know breaking your uh, your walls, uh, uh, you know internal party vendettas that's that sounds really familiar to Polish politics students so. Uh, Mm, I don't know what, what is the conclusion. Probably that stereotypes are a little bit uh, restricting our uh, uh, perception of, uh, uh, of the reality. Uh, but I just wanted to stress that uh, thanks to the uh, emigration of uh, two million of Poles to, to Britain, we now have much bigger knowledge of the British culture, not only you know, this literary 19th century uh, stereotypes, but also uh, an immediate first-hand uh, experience of uh, young uh, lower class uh, uh, male coming just for drinking beer. Uh, that's, that's something really changing the, uh, 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 the knowledge of, uh, of the British uh, culture and politics. So uh, I don't know uh, if, if in, in a large scale it changes something, uh, probably not. Probably these 19th century stereotypes are uh, much uh, deeper rooted than, than we expected. But on the other hand, we, uh, I'm not quite sure we, uh, uh, we uh, should allow ourselves to, to stick to them uh, and to, to go uh, through these, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, traditional channels of thinking that, okay, uh, British politics was rational, is rational, uh, and Poles are romantic. Uh, well, sometimes yes, sometimes not. Okay, so sorry for this uh, a little bit destructive uh, comment. Thank you so much. And I think it's, it's really, um, I really appreciate that we have the balance uh, between uh, Polish opinions and British opinions now, because because I think it, it should be preserved in this debate that that we can see in uh, each other's eyes uh, eyes. So uh, please, maybe uh, any more comments to this? I would like to well just to follow. Um, I think that uh, we should also consider the twentieth uh, century experiences with uh, actual uh, cooperation. Uh, between the governments during Second World War, which was, uh, which is remembered, maybe, well, it is remembered in Poland on, uh, um, uh, first as, as a, a time of, of uh, uh, glorious cooperation, because fighting with the, with the enemies, and, uh, and second, uh, uh, not so um, positive uh, remembrance about, about this uh, final of this cooperation. So the, uh, uh, so, so the situation after the Second World War. And also, uh, there is, uh, it is also remembered, maybe not so, it's not so fresh memory, but uh, about the uh, Versailles conference, where the British government, so Prime Minister Lloyd George, 
uh, was against uh, the, uh, it was a proposed limit to the uh, territory territorial scope of new developed Poland so uh, there the uh, experiences which were on the different level so between governments not not just between the partitioned country and the British Empire uh, so probably do you have any comments about this this recent or recent history uh, well please. maybe yeah I mean it, it, in many ways it, it ties back to the points that that, that professor Schlachter and and Butterwick Palikowski were making about the idea of the um, I mean when I said that the that, that Poles had um, the that the, the Brits had the image of Poles as um, freedom fighters um, uh, and that you know that was associated with a lot of positive stereotypes it's a, it's a double-edged sword as well I think as far as um, British perceptions are concerned because there's there's a kind of downside to it and the the experiences I think that Poles had and their perceptions of, of where they ended up at the end of the Second World War and the role of the British government in that, I think very much speaks to that. Um, I mean, I think, I mean, I don't know whether I count as, as a Polish or English contributor in, to, to, to this discussion. When, when I'm in Britain, I tend to feel myself very Polish. And when I come to Poland, I tend to realise how British I am. But, but in, I mean, I think the, the British self-image is of, 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 a, of, a, of a people who are very kind of plucky and determined. Um, they are um, tolerant, difficult to, um, uh, to, to, slow to get angry, but when they do, they're kind of extremely determined and see things through. And that really maps well, I think, onto the stereotype of, of Poles. I think, you know, that, that um, uh, the, 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 the idea, particularly the second bit, you know, that when, when you stand up for something, you know, you really stand up for it and you're, and you're not pushed around. But the downside of that, the other edge of the sword of, of the freedom fighter is, is rubs up against the British self-image of, of, you know, pragmatism, practicality, um, and whereas, you know, the, the image of Poles is of, you know, continuing to fight when, when the cause is, is hopeless, which is great if, you know, someone's on your side, but if you're trying to do deals in an international realpolitik context, then um, uh, it's potentially very problematic. And here, I think, you know, the Second World War is, is, you know, very important because obviously for the British government, Poland was a very useful ally in the sense it provided, you know, brilliant cannon fodder for battles like, you know, Narvik, Tobruk, um, uh, Monte Cassino, you know, where my grandfather fought. Um, but, 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 you know, was, when it comes to the kind of great power play um, negotiations, at, uh, you know, in Yalta and Potsdam with the Soviet Union, suddenly became very, very awkward. And that kind of Polish cussedness, the freedom fightingness, then rubbed up against the British practicality and and, 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 and pragmatism. One thing I'll say on this is, is that the, the, that wound, I think, is much more deeply felt among Poles. Um, the apparent betrayal of, um, uh, of, of, of Poles um, at the end of the Second World War um, than it is anywhere in the consciousness of, 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 of a lot of Brits, I don't think. I mean, I, I think they have very little appreciation of this. I'll give you one little anecdote that illustrates this. Um, a friend of mine um, went to do an interview with, with Lech Wałęsa, uh, not, 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 not so long ago. He's a historian and he was, you know, doing interviews with, with people who were involved in the anti-communist opposition. And I said to him, how did it go? And he said, Bowenza spent the first half hour haranguing me about Yalta, basically, and, you know, getting me to defend and to apologize for Yalta. And I had no idea, you know, this was kind of coming my way. Um, and so, you know, and, and so it's, it's something that, you know, for, 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 for Brits, I think, um, unless, you know, they're really kind of you know, they work in the, the Foreign Office and their job is to, you know, really immerse themselves in Polish history and culture. I think there's very, very little knowledge of that, never mind the role of, you know, Britain at, at, at the Treaty of Versailles. I mean, you know, that's that's completely, I mean, Lloyd George or whatever, you know, most Welshmen would have no idea about that. So it's very, it's very asymmetrical. I think, and and as I say, that the freedom fighter thing is is for for Brits is a double edged sword. There's things they really like about it, but there's things that also means that that, that poles can be um, very annoying, you know, quite insufferable at times, and also very inconvenient if it gets in the if they get in the way of you know real real politics and power politics. Thank you. Uh, so maybe uh, also Professor uh, Butterwick Paklikowski would comment this because. From the British point of view, uh, is there is there a, 
is, is, it, is there really a knowledge about this uh, Second World War hard uh, memory? Uh, and is it really, uh, how is it remembered today, if it is, uh, anyhow? Oh, well, this is very stimulating. First of all, I'd like to say that Professor Voek is absolutely right uh, to point out the limitations of stereotypes and the exceptions to, uh, to stereotypes. After all, there's plenty of romanticism to be found in sort of English, Scottish, Welsh and Irish culture. Uh, in I would make a distinction between the perceptions of ordinary people, particularly in the last generation, since there has been a mass encounter with Poles, and perhaps also in the last three or four generations since the Second World War, when there's been at least a significant real encounter of, of ordinary people uh, with Poles, uh, to the perceptions of those who actually shape uh, British uh, policies. There is uh, uh, that question of sort of calculating pragmatism. I don't really think that applies to the people who go on stag weekends to Krakow, and I don't really think it applies uh, to the people in the 1950s who had a Polish neighbour and could barely begin to comprehend the things that uh, that their neighbour might have gone through during the uh, the Second World War. I think these are you know, rather different things. And, it, and we shouldn't be sort of lumping together the uh, you know, popular perceptions of Poles, which, to be honest, didn't really exist before the Second World War, uh, and the attitudes of uh, policymakers. With regard to the Second World War, in, in 1939, Poland was not such an obvious ally uh, for Great Britain as it had been for France. There had been a very long uh, political tradition of sort of French interest in Poland, reaching back several centuries. But if you put together all of the diplomatic relations between England and then Britain, and then Poland and then Poland-Lithuania over the centuries, it really doesn't account to all that much. And it's something that occasionally disturbs 19th century policymakers rather than being at the sort of the heart uh, of their concerns. And then suddenly, 1939 to 40, uh, Poland becomes, you know, for a while, the most important ally uh, to uh, Great Britain. And then equally suddenly in 1941, it gets completely eclipsed by the role of the Soviet Union and then the United States as the powers that are really going to determine uh, the outcome of the Second World War. And it's already, I think, by the middle of the Second World War, uh, from the, polit the political elite's point of view, uh, that the Poles are becoming a bit of an embarrassment. Uh, and this afternoon, in fact, I was just reading uh, the, intro the preface, which was, uh, or the foreword to George Orwell's Animal Farm, which was written to towards the end of the Second World War, uh, but not published along with the, uh, the tale in 1945. And Orwell lays bare the adulation of the Soviet Union uh, uh, on the part of sort of left-leaning uh, intellectuals of the sort that sort of he himself had been before he sort of saw the light about Stalinism uh, during the uh, the second uh, the Spanish Civil War. So uh, on the left, among trade union leaders, uh, among uh, intellectuals, the Poles are such an embarrassment by the end of the Second World War that it's only too easy to dredge up those stereotypes from the past about Catholic fanaticism and noble oppression and uh, political anarchy. In that sense, those sort of long-term stereotypes uh, can, for intellectuals uh, who, who really should know better, but don't sometimes, uh, can help to shape the, the flip side of that sort of freedom fighter image that, uh, that Alex, Professor Shabiak was talking about. Well, great. It was really strong. <laughs> What you said <clears throat> about about this this uh, mix of, of, of different uh, of different stereotypes. Well, uh, maybe I'd like also Professor Schlachter to comment this. Uh, how do you think about about this about um, these pictures? And maybe uh, do we still have a different uh, kind of of uh, impacts of British uh, political tradition and and. Uh, uh, this realism 
this pragmatism, this famous pragmatism of the British Empire, which was uh, preserved in, in uh, some form, uh, do we still uh, have an impact of, on, on uh, do we still notice the impact on, on the ideas? Oh, so, my dear chairman, I don't know. Uh, first um, problem for, from my point of view uh, is with uh, the mm, perspective of, uh, of uh, ordinary uh, Britons uh, toward Pol Poles uh, between two uh, world wars. Uh, for example, uh, Gilbert uh, uh, Chesterton said that, uh, that Britons has a perspective which is uh, uh, connected with the uh, 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 idea of Middle Europa, uh, German uh, idea of Middle Europa. Uh, uh, Poles and Poland, uh, independent after the First World War, was only a part of Middle Europa, uh, European uh, uh, um, uh, uh, idea or conception of uh, Germans. And from second um, uh, point of view, also which was, uh, was uh, um, uh, pointed but, but, uh, by, uh, by Chesterton, uh, Poles are only part of the uh, uh, Eastern uh, great uh, people which is uh, uh, which is uh, slaves. Uh, Chesterton said that uh, Poles are uh, in uh, in the German project or are um, members of the of the, the great uh, people, which uh, in, in the, during which inside which uh, the, the crucial point uh, is uh, connected with uh, Russians. Uh, from my perspective, it is very important problem because because uh, the perspective which was uh, uh, characteristic for for uh, chesterton um, uh, uh, it is is, is uh, very very um, uh, uh, interesting because poles are not a uh, independent player uh, Poland was not an independent player, but from our Polish point of view, between these two uh, world wars, uh, Poland was very important play uh, and independent player between two great, uh, great uh, states, between uh, in, uh, Germany and uh, Russia, uh, Soviet Russia, yes, and uh, here is, uh, from our Polish perspective, very important that uh, Britons uh, saw us as an independent uh, player in Central Europe uh, in, uh, in, uh, the, the, um, uh, from the 1933 to the 1939. But uh, after, um, after this uh, moment that uh, then uh, um, be, uh, began the, the Second World War. Uh, Polish problems is not the same because Poland has no independent Poles has not uh, had no independent uh, state, and we are only a part of the uh, of the uh, uh, Russian or Soviet or or, uh, or um, the armies of the of the. Um, uh, uh, Western Western uh, Alliance. Uh, after the Second uh, World War, we are once again as a, as a uh, Poles. We are we are once again only the not very important uh, players in the second uh, Central Europe, and we are uh, uh, thanks to the to the uh, decision in Yalta first of all uh, part of this. Uh, a great um, camp of the um, communist or, or uh, Soviet uh, Soviet countries. Uh, so here is a problem, very important, as I think, because now, as I think, uh, the, the politicians from the Great uh, Great Britain uh, see us as a, as a Poles or, or as a Polish independent uh, state, 
as a the, the, as a important part first of all of the, the European Union and uh, we are um, uh, in this uh, in this uh, European camp as a very important um, uh, player in this part of the European Union. Uh, and as I think uh, and I, I hope that that we as a Poles and independent Poland was uh, still uh, the important uh, player from the perspective of British politicians. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, it's great that we are approaching the uh, contemporary uh, issues because uh, I think it's, it's uh, time to, to think about the presence and future of the possible uh, Polish-British political relations. So it's true that uh, uh, Great Britain and Poland uh, find themselves uh, some point as the, at some point as the outsiders in the European Union. Uh, so there is, of course, a traditional British skepticism uh, for the European integration, which finally led to Brexit. And uh, also, in the, especially in recent years, we can see in the uh, Polish uh, government's policy uh, uh, distance, distancing uh, from the direction of so-called federalist European project. Uh, so I, I'm just thinking, uh, could we say that these experiences could be a plan for cooperation? Uh, usually it is said that uh, Brexit distances uh, Britain from Poland, but maybe uh, there is uh, also a chance for, for uh, another sort of cooperation. How do you think? Uh, please, Professor uh, Artur Bowek, please. Uh... I guess it's quite dangerous uh, for me to begin this topic because uh, I've got quite strong convictions about the Brexit, which is quite irrational uh, uh, for for somebody not uh, involved in in the in the issue. Uh, but my impression is that that Brexit happened to Britain, and it's not an expression of uh, some deep. Uh, 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 threats of uh, uh, British identity, or maybe it is, but but politics, party politics, is much more important uh, in, in the whole Brexit saga than uh, uh, than we, uh, as uh, uh, I don't know, uh, historians or uh, historians of ideas, uh, tend to think. Uh, and uh, this is something which is. Uh, uh, probably most important uh, uh, lesson for for Polish politics as well that uh, uh, look what happens to uh, those who are said to be pragmatic and realist. Uh, something wrong. Something may go wrong with uh, uh, with their politics. So perhaps uh, also something may go wrong with Polish politics and. Polex, it also may happen to us. Uh, but uh, frankly speaking, uh, uh, well, being more more serious, perhaps uh, this cooperation just before the uh, the Brexit. I mean, during uh, the Cameron government and Theresa May government, uh, th there was a, a real cooperation. Uh, even before uh, 2015, when 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 the present government took over, uh, and this was uh, a real poll uh, in the European Union poll of uh, anti-federalist, uh, 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 I would say nations. Yes, not only governments but nations, because the uh, the the previous government uh, also had quite strong anti-federalist stance. So. Uh, uh, perhaps you, you, you are right saying that uh, uh, th th there was something to there, there was something deeper uh, uh, behind this cooperation, uh, but this is not a, a good prognostic for 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 the future because uh, my impression is that British politics is uh, is a mess now, 
uh, and uh, you really don't know what would happen. Uh, I mean, there is no strategy for Britain after the Brexit. So uh, Poland is not important or neither unimportant uh, because uh, all those nice ideas about, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 British, uh, Britain sailing uh, in the oceans of free market and cooperation with Australia, New Zealand, and uh, perhaps Canada. Uh, it's, it's irrational. It's, I mean, you, you can't build a, a realistic strategy uh, on this. And, and today it's, it's obvious uh, uh, that this, this is a, a defunct strategy if it was a strategy. Uh, and this is also true about Polish politics, that uh, it's, a, it's a mess, that there is no strategy for the presence of Poland in, uh, in Europe now. It's, it's just a, a, a reaction, a reaction uh, for uh, Brussels uh, measures, uh, uh, for uh, uh, Brussels measures uh, trying to uh, to 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 somehow uh, restrict the the internal uh, uh, Polish uh, politics uh, braveries, I would say. Uh, so uh, very bad moment for, uh, for 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 making predictions and for taking uh, history as a uh, as a as a hint for uh, for the future developments. Uh, uh, if there is something in common, this is this. Uh, this unstable situation after a, a, a kind of important uh, uh, happenings of 2015, 2019, I would say, in both countries. Can I come in? Of course. Yeah. So I think the first thing to say is, um, I mean, the British, British government is um, uh, more committed than ever, I think, to um, developing strong bilateral links with, with Poland after Brexit. Um, I mean, I think their, their strategy is very much that, you know, no longer as relations are no longer mediated through the European Union. It's to build strong bilateral ties with um, uh, potential European allies. And Poland is really high on the list of, of, of potential European allies. And the British government is in, you know, I can see my, for myself, you know, they, they've investing a lot of uh, political capital and also resources into that. I mean, you know, the Belvedere Forum, which some people may be involved in the attempt to create a civil society platform um, for cooperation between, you know, Pol Pol Polish and English communities and, and intellectuals is, is a very good example of that. I'll say one thing about um, the differences between Poland and England in and Britain in terms of their attitudes towards the European Union. So, I mean, what's really important is um, in Britain, um, it's perfectly, it's always been perfectly possible to construct a historical narrative that doesn't include Britain inevitably becoming part of the European Union. Okay. Um, I mean, this, this was best encapsulated by a slogan coined by the leader of the Labour Party in the 1950s, a chap called uh, Hugh Gateskill, who said that if, Brit if Britain joined the coal and steel community, the precursor of the EU, it would be abandoning a thousand years of history. Okay, a thousand years of history. In Poland, for a long period, um, after Poland um, sh shook off communism and, and became a free democratic country, um, the membership of the European Union was seen as a historical and civilizational choice. Okay? It was about reuniting with the West culturally and spiritually. Okay? So that institutional um, uh, uh, unification, if you like, joining the, 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 the um, European institutions was seen as very much a kind of a civilizational project. Okay? In Britain, it's never really been seen as a civilizational project, apart from, from, from a minority of of, of, of people, and it's perfectly possible to construct a historical narrative that didn't involve you know, Britain being a member of the European Union. I do wonder how much that has changed in Poland, and I wonder whether that kind of romantic idea of, um, of, of rejoining the West, of, of hi historical civilizational unity, has, has receded. And, and with the current generation of Poles, even those who you know, still support membership of the European Union, which the great bulk of them do, I wonder whether it's much more instrumental. And it's, it's about, you know, the, the costs and benefits 
in terms of access to labor markets, in terms of EU funds, things like that, much more than this kind of romantic abstract notion. It's so one more thing on this. Um, I mean, the reason that, that, that Britain left the European Union was, and, and the majority voted, was because a lot of people who were soft Eurosceptics became hard Eurosceptics. Okay, there were people who were, were anti-federalist. Okay, they didn't like the trajectory of the, of the European Union, but they felt that it could be reformed from within in a direction that was much more in keeping with what they wanted. In Poland, the, uh, they came to the conclusion that wasn't possible. Okay, and, and, and that's why a lot of those people in the end, although they had been members, supporters of membership of the European Union, as indeed, you know, Margaret Thatcher had, strong supporter of it, most conservatives, you know, supported Britain joining the EC or whatever, came to the conclusion that it was irreformable. Okay, that there was something about the European Union which meant, you know, it was, it was untouchable to the democratic process to change it the way that, that, that you did. In Poland, most soft Eurosceptics are still, most Eurosceptics are still soft Eurosceptics. Okay, so you know, the, the current government who are anti-federalist, who, you know, don't, don't want, who want, you know, return of powers, a more intergovernmental model, still believe or rhetorically believe that the, that the European Union can be reformed. Okay, they still haven't come to that conclusion, okay, that the EU is irreformable. Now, the interesting thing will be, what happens if the, the cost benefit, if, if polls are driven by a cost benefit analysis in terms of whether they think they should be members of the European Union, what happens if that cost benefit analysis changes? And Poles no longer think that they're materially benefiting from it. And what happens if Poland's soft Eurosceptics become convinced, like the current government, for example, become convinced that, that they can't achieve their objectives um, and that it's, from their point of view, irreformable? That will be interesting. Thank you. Thank you. It's a it's really good point that, uh, that, uh, that uh, costs and uh, benefits of the presence in the, in the EU uh, European Union project should be calculated on every member state, I would think. So it's, it's, it's really important, both for Poland and for Britain, uh, as, at, as it led finally to, the, to exiting the Union. Uh, I think I would say that uh, probably because the try to construct the new narrative uh, was made, but uh, Actually, the idea was, of course, to have special relations with the United States, like Britain uh, usually preserves the special relations with the United States. And um, unfortunately, it, it's not possible uh, at this moment, uh, as, as it was imagined by the, pre, by, um, by the present government. So uh, maybe uh, we could learn in, in uh, longer experience from uh, from Britain, from British people, how to preserve such kinds of special relations. Uh, I would like to, uh, maybe we're, because we are approaching to the uh, end of our debate, but maybe I'd like also uh, to ask for some final comments. Uh, maybe Professor Batarut Pavlikowski for the final comments about the presence and future, and then Professor Schlachta for the final comment, and then we'll focus the well, um, thank you for the opportunity to say something. It, it is hard to sort of comment uh, about Brexit, given its uh, sort of you know, deep personal impact. I will say this to finish, that uh, we must remember that the Polish and the British nations are profoundly polarised. Uh, that sort of reactions uh, to the European Union uh, in both countries, albeit in somewhat different ways, uh, have become much more polarised in the in the last uh, few years, and that for many members of society, perhaps especially younger members of uh, society, although that's not a hard and fast rule. You know, whatever seems to be the line coming from the government, it will provoke a visceral reaction. And this is taking place against the background of a global culture war, uh, where the politics of identity, whether they're national or religious or gender or any other kind of identities, have become far more important than sort of pragmatic uh, cost uh, and benefit analysis. And in both cases, in different ways, I think this is what is contributing to the 
that inability to predict the future uh, that uh, Professor Voet was referring to. Thank you. And uh, yes, please, Professor Schlachter, uh, I would like to ask you for your final comment also. So we, we I suppose, are not only polarized, but uh, also divided between this uh, who are uh, interested in the participating uh, in the European Union as a, a federal state and this uh, one who are interested in uh, in the um, um, uh, still have the, the independent position of the uh, nation state uh, here is very important uh, for us uh, discussion about this uh, this uh, um, problem to uh, the future of the European Union. We must uh, still, uh, maybe better will be this, uh, we should cooperate, uh, Poles and Britons, we should cooperate between, because we are now in this uh, very interesting uh, uh, turning point of the, of the uh, uh, geopolitics, as I, as I think. Uh, uh, the Great Britain will be, as I think, uh, still uh, closer to the United States. Uh, uh, and uh, this is one uh, player. Second player is the European Union. Uh, and we will, as I think, uh, compete between these uh, two players. Uh, third uh, player is the uh, Russian Federation, third, fourth, uh, and, and so on, are China uh, and, and uh, and uh, in, for example, India. But uh, here is very interesting for us to, uh, to cooperate not only with uh, uh, the European Union, uh, which the crucial, the crucial position has uh, Germany, uh, but also with, the great, with Great Britain and with the United States. And here is not very, uh, very uh, um, fresh uh, information, very fresh idea but it is idea uh, which is for uh, from my point of view very very uh, important to the future thank you thank you so much uh, thank you for all the participants for the great comments and and for the great ideas that uh, have appeared during our debate uh, so in this journey in this extensive journey to the political history of Poland and the United Kingdom we have reached the end, the end of chapter, probably. But uh, I hope that the story of the mutual relations and inspirations will uh, will continue and uh, will allow for the future cooperation. And uh, I hope that uh, the British and Polish people will still um, be present uh, in in both countries and, and will exchange and will migrate. Uh, for the for the mutual uh, profit of, of of our societies. So uh, I'd like to thank you very much for the uh, for the today's debate. I hope that uh, it it was interesting for uh, all of us. For the, for me, it was actually it was extremely interesting. So uh, really great time spent here with you and. Um, Thank you for the participation in this uh, project, and I hope we'll have a chance to continue these topics in, uh, in the next occasions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good night.